Always, it's always amazing to come back here, and it feels especially so now with this book that's really about people and places over time. Uh, because I feel like there's so much of my history in this place, but also kind of in this room. My teacher, Diana Cavallo, Dan Hoffman, who was my advisor when I was editing the Penn Review, my best friend, Monica Adler, who I met day one in Hill House freshman year, um, a new friend, Becky, who I didn't even know was a Penn alum, um, who's, a, who's the mom of a good friend of my, my son's. Um, so it just feels really wonderful to be here. Um, I would like to just take a moment to, um, to say a word about Romulus Linney, who passed away fairly recently and was a real mentor for me at Penn also. I worked with him independently for two years and, uh, and wrote a creative thesis with his help. So I really, um, he was a wonderful teacher and I, I really am I'm very sorry that he's not with us anymore, but I will certainly always remember the things that he taught me. Um, the, uh, another piece of history that's here for me is Sam, who I think we've been here twice before, unless I'm mistaken. I remember coming here and hearing Sam read as an undergrad and just being blown out of my chair. Um, and it's been, it's been great to be in touch and now to see you out of college and moving through your life. Again, it's, it's, it's exactly the feeling I was trying to capture in this book. Um, and also, you know, Penn itself, which helped to shape me so much. There was no writer's house here. But I feel like this is the place that I walked around dreaming of being a writer. And it's just, it's incredible every time to come back and think, wow, I actually did that. That's incredible. How did I do that? It just reminds me of, um, you know, the, the, a time when it was just all a fantasy. Um, and I am so grateful to the Writer's House for making it so easy and so lovely to come back. And I plan to keep doing so. So thank you all. Uh, I'm going to read the first chapter of A Visit from the Goon Squad, um, Found Objects. It began the usual way in the bathroom of the Lassimo Hotel. Sasha was adjusting her yellow eyeshadow in the mirror when she noticed a bag on the floor beside the sink that must have belong belonged to the woman whose peeing she could faintly hear through the vault-like door of a toilet stall. Inside the rim of the bag, barely visible, was a wallet made of pale green leather. It was easy for Sasha to recognize, looking back, that the peeing woman's blind trust had provoked her. We live in a city where people will steal the hair off your head if you give them half a chance, but you leave your stuff lying in plain sight and expect it to be waiting for you when you come back? It made her want to teach the woman a lesson. But this wish only camouflaged the deeper feeling Sasha always had, that fat, tender wallet offering itself to her hand. It seemed so dull, so life as usual, to just leave it there, rather than seize the moment, accept the challenge, take the leap, fly the coop, throw caution to the wind, live dangerously. I get it, cause her therapist said. And taking thing, you mean steal it. He was trying to get Sasha to use that word, which was harder to avoid in the case of a wallet than with a lot of the things she'd lifted over the past year when her condition, as Cause referred to it, had begun to accelerate. Five sets of keys, 14 pairs of sunglasses, a child's striped scarf, binoculars, a cheese grater, a pocket knife, 28 bars of soap, and 85 pens ranging from cheap ballpoints she'd used to sign debit card slips to the aubergine Visconti that cost $260 online, which she'd lifted from her former boss's lawyer during a contracts meeting. Sasha no longer took anything from stores. Their cold, inert goods didn't tempt her, only from people. Okay, she said, steal it. Sasha and Kaz had dubbed that feeling she got the personal challenge, as in taking the wallet was a way for Sasha to assert her toughness, her individuality. What they needed to do was switch things around in her head so that the challenge became not taking the wallet, but leaving it. That would be the cure, although Kaz never used words like cure. He wore funky sweaters and let her call him Kaz, but he was old school inscrutable to the point where Sasha couldn't tell if he was gay or straight, if he'd written famous books, or if, as she sometimes suspected, he was one of those escaped cons who impersonate surgeons and wind up leaving their operating tools inside people's skulls. Of course, these questions could have been resolved on Google in less than a minute, but they were useful questions, according to Kaz, and so far, Sasha had resisted. The couch where she lay in his office was blue leather and very soft. 
Kaz liked the couch, he told her, because it relieved them both of the burden of eye contact. You don't like eye contact? Sasha had asked. It seemed like a weird thing for a therapist to admit. I find it tiring, he'd said. This way we can both look where we want. Where will you look? He smiled. You can see my options. Where do you usually look when people are on the couch? Around the room, Kaz said, at the ceiling, into space. Do you ever sleep? No. Sasha usually looked at the window which faced the street, and tonight, as she continued her story, was rippled with rain. She'd glimpsed the wallet, tender and overripe as a peach. She'd plucked it from the woman's bag and slipped it into her own small handbag, which she'd zipped shut before the sound of peeing had stopped. She'd flicked open the bathroom door and floated back through the lobby to the bar. She and the wallet's owner had never seen each other. Pre-wallet, Sasha had been in the grip of a dire evening. Lame date, yet another, brooding behind dark bangs, sometimes glancing at the flat screen TV where a Jets game seemed to interest him more than Sasha's admittedly overhandled tales of Benny Salazar, her old boss, who was famous for founding the Sow's Ear record label and who also, Sasha happened to know, sprinkled gold flakes into his coffee, as an aphrodisiac she suspected, and sprayed pesticide in his armpits. Post-wallet, however, the scene tingled with mirthful possibility. Sasha felt the waiters eyeing her as she sidled back to the table, holding her handbag with its secret weight. She sat down and took a sip of her melon madness martini and cocked her head at Alex. She smiled her yes-no smile. Hello, she said. The yes-no smile was amazingly effective. You're happy, Alex said. I'm always happy, Sasha said. Sometimes I just forget. Alex had paid the bill while she was in the bathroom, clear proof that he'd been on the verge of aborting their date. Now he studied her. You feel like going somewhere else? They stood. Alex wore black cords and a white button-up shirt. He was a legal secretary. On email, he'd been fanciful, almost goofy, but in person he seemed simultaneously anxious and bored. She could tell that he was in excellent shape, not from going to the gym, but from being young enough that his body was still imprinted with whatever sports he'd played in high school and college. Sasha, who was 35, had passed that point. Still, not even Kaz knew her real age. The closest anyone had come to guessing it was 31, and most put her in her 20s. She worked out daily and avoided the sun. Her online profiles all listed her as 28. As she followed Alex from the bar, she couldn't resist unzipping her purse and touching the fat green wallet just for a second for the contraction it made her feel around her heart. You're aware of how the theft makes you feel, to cause said, to the point where you remind yourself of it to improve your mood, but do you think about how it makes the other person feel? Sasha tipped back her head to look at him. She made a point of doing this now and then, just to remind Kaz that she wasn't an idiot. She knew the question had a right answer. She and Kaz were collaborators, writing a story whose end had already been determined. She would get well. She would stop stealing from people and start caring again about the things that once had guided her. Music, the network of friends she'd made when she first came to New York, a set of goals she'd scrawled on a big sheet of newsprint and taped to the walls of her early apartments. Find a band to manage. Understand the news. Study Japanese. Practice the harp. I don't think about the people, Sasha said. 